right and you are all very welcome today thank you so much for joining us for this 42 courses subscription only event where we are so delighted today to be joined by Tom Rothenberg. Tom is the global president of Rufus, IPD's specialized marketing agency group dedicated to the world's number one brand, Amazon, who we are, of course, all extremely familiar with. He's based in, the LA, in LA. He oversees a 30 country team of over a thousand staff working in over 25 different individual agencies and covers media, creative sponsorship, data partnerships, uh, working with a huge number, 30 more different Amazon lines of business. But let's allow Tom to tell you a little bit more about himself rather than me talking about him, to tell us a bit more about what he does in his job with Amazon. And of course, how you got there, Tom, because you're extremely experienced in many other areas, agency side. So Tom, you're very welcome. Oof, extremely experienced, makes me sound old. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's true, though. So thanks so much, um, Louise and Irene and hi to all the, the 42 Courses community. Um, been a supporter of 42 Courses since the beginning. Um, I know the, the founders and worked with them in various capacities over the years. So very happy to, to give you a little window of time into my life and hopefully provide some value and give you some interesting stories and points of view as you guys go through your learning journeys around marketing and creativity. So yeah, as Louise mentioned, um, done a few things around, around, uh, around this kind of world myself. Um, started out as I think, you know, lots of us did as a, as a, a thrusting young person in, in a creative advertising agency. I was a big believer that the agency environment was about the best place you could go to get your hands across different kinds of businesses and business problems and challenges and learn about how, you know, this nebula nascent thing called creativity we're going to talk about a lot today how it really worked because you kind of as a as a as a kind of receiver as someone growing up you learn you get a sense of what's like interesting interesting business interesting brand interesting work and other stuff isn't and you're like how, how does that work so i started in in creative agencies in a couple of the the wpp shops as a as a baby at um uh ogilvy and at gray um and then kind of i guess Made, made my whatever name I have in this industry at McCann um, in the late, whatever that decade is called, between 2000 and 2010, uh, a while ago. I joined um, McCann to do a couple of things, one of which was run the Xbox advertising and Microsoft Game Studios creative accounts for Europe, um, Middle East and Africa. And it was a really interesting time in gaming. Those of you who, who spent any time with that category will remember some of the kind of seismic shifts that came as the tech evolved to so the xbox 360 ps3 generation but also like marketing for video games went from like cut a trailer put some sound on it release it to gamers and off we go to suddenly this youtube powered world of like hang on a sec we could tell much richer bigger stories and there are probably no more uh interesting developed nuanced huge massive entertainment properties than video games you know, people spend 20,000 hours in, in these, in these, in these worlds. So how can we tell those, those, those stories to people in a way that's new, exciting and challenging. And I did some of my best work in my career in that era for uh, games like Halo 3. Anyone who's a game will recognize the Master Chief helmet back up here from our campaign in 2008. We got the Grand Prix at Cannes, Grand Prix at the APG Strategy Awards, Grand Prix at the Effies. Still, I think the only campaign ever to get a Grand Prix at a major strategy creative and effectiveness award we could talk about that a bit later on today but i love work loved working on xbox love working in the video game category um and allowed me to kind of you know move from being a a one country tv or not tv one country advertising guy to a kind of multi-country multi-discipline guy because we led an integrated team working around events and experiential and all sorts of other stuff so that that sent me down a path um that with a small detour to be the chief growth officer of McCann in London, looking after kind of, you know, growth and a new business for the agency. Um, I left the advertising agency world um, 2013 after a few years to do something generally different and keep, keep on that mission. Um, joined a friend, we had a mobile tech startup. So out of the world of content, out of the world of 
I guess, you know, advertising and into running a business. Um, I will not bore you with the full intricacies of everything we did, but it started as a um, Java-based platform that allowed us to write code across different mobile operating systems for people who wanted to get into the app economy that was kind of booming uh, around 2013. But you still have this strange world of not just Apple with iOS and, and um, Android, but Samsung had their own operating system back then. BlackBerry was still a player. Windows Mobile was still a player. Um, it all seems like a very long time ago. Uh, and people had this challenge of going, I want to get into apps. There's this new forum for how we connect to customers and how we can build parts of our brand and our service and our business. But the industry was so immature and nascent that everyone was using literally different languages to write code or to write apps in. So it's incredibly expensive. You have to write six bits of software. And we said, hey, write it once. We'll charge you three times as much as one app you can deploy across all six. Good business until all the other operating systems fell away. Uh, we pivoted to be an iOS and an Android specialized um, developer, worked with all kinds of interesting companies. Um, I built the app for FIFA for the World Cup in Brazil in 2014, a load, load of apps for um, financial companies, both in customer finance, but also like um, payment solutions. We worked with Visa and MasterCard, who took stakes in a company that then acquired us. So I had a great, a great journey, like bringing the things I'd learned as a, as a kind of like old school creative person working in ad agency out to deal with like, how do you create a business? How do you build a proposition for a company? How do you then keep that proposition alive through an acquisition? Because we got, we got acquired. And then again, a double acquisition because the guys who acquired us got acquired because technology is fun like that. So um, got a really good sense of like how you hang on to the things that, make, that made our business difference. And we were, we were creative at heart, even in that technology world differentials of design and we could talk about again some of that today um uh following the second acquisition i then had a couple of years of um doing some consultancy work helped helped a few agencies that my friends had get get bought because i was a guy who'd done a company sale which is a great journey not a creative journey but a legal and financial one um and did interesting projects with interesting brands or businesses that were looking for some sense of kind of innovation or change or, or, or new thinking from from the outside and you know businesses love to bring in people who are familiar enough with the subject but have a different perspective um and whether that's an agency or a private individual for my consultancy in this case i did that for a couple of years it was great fun um met my wife got married she's from south africa as i know many of the folks here have got some base camp out there we lived in cape town for a while so you know life life was great and then out of the blue slightly i got a call from some of my old colleagues from into public group because i'm mccann is the main creative network for IPG um, to come and help out on, on a rebooting and, re and reshaping one of their, um, I guess, uh, historically great agency brands. It was a little uh, little un unvarnished, should we say. Um, and so in 2017, I began working with Initiative Media. I still remember my first call from the, the CEO who'd just taken over. I was like, I could, I'm a media agency, like of all the things I've done, creative agencies, worked in tech, I can't even spell media. I mean, I can, but basically I can't spell media. Are you sure you want me to help? And he said, no, no, I've got lots of people in this company who, who know media, but not that many people who know how to re-engineer businesses and do the kind of turnaround and work with clients that we have. So, um, and inject some creativity, again, to, to use that word. So I moved to New York in 2017 and started working with Initiative as the chief client officer. That brought me into the world of Amazon, which... Um, uh, I then moved out to Los Angeles and ran full time, not just for initiative, but across the IPG group, as, as Louise set up. So that is, I think I come, I'm, the stats are probably out of date, but the bio I wrote from, from last week is probably about right. We have a whole ton of agencies working on Amazon. Um, we have the, a big chunk of media business, which is kind of how do we find people who care about all the various Amazon products and services and, and persuade them. But I'm doing creative, I'm running, I'm running events both in the B2B and B2C space. We're working on partnerships and sponsorships for things that we can talk about and things I can't talk about yet for the future. Um, really consulting them on how they spend what is, uh, I have to be careful with Amazon, I'm not allowed to say much. There, there was a report that they were the world's largest advertiser and that report is factually very close to the reality. Whether other people spend more or not, no comment, but you can read their, their, annual, their annual reports and they spend over 19 billion dollars a year on promotion and marketing. So it's, you know, it's a big company and they do some amazing things. Um, we help them in pretty much every aspect of, of that. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, a thread that aligns it, I guess there are two threads that align it, right? With, with Amazon, it's, they are a relentlessly ambitious company. And so they, they have very high standards, famously so, you can read their, their tenets. We, we can also talk about that. But, you know, there, there is a, an expectation of not, not good, but great across all touch points that, that feed the customer experience. And that means that we are relentlessly being challenged on the right level of creativity and push harder and go again. There's a real tension between get it done and get it done excellently, which exists in all tech companies, exists in all business, but tech really are the kind of the flag bearers for that. Um, and the second side for Amazon is a relentless focus on measurement and optimization because they as a business are, um, they believe that things get bigger, they get more efficient. It's kind of what sits at the heart of the flywheel Excuse me, I've got some roadworks going outside. But, um, it sits at the heart of the flywheel, which is their, you know, their, their secret source of their business. As the thing gets bigger and more people come in, you get more choice and costs go down and customers do better and on you go. And they've, they've really challenged us as an agency team to go, how can you, while not like having your own flywheel that works the same way, follow those principles, track, measure, analyze, and optimize so that over time we can do not just better, but also build more efficient teams and structures and processes. And that's the, that's the heart of the, the, the challenge for us these days on Amazon. It's like right creativity and actually measure it so that once you measure it, you can manage it. Um, and I think the, the, the really interesting discussions that are coming for that big C word creativity in our industry are all about that. Um, this year, this year it can Mark Pritchard, who has the, I guess the semi unofficial job of being the kind of voice of, of marketing as the CMO of Procter and Gamble used to be the world's biggest advertiser. Yeah. Not so much anymore. Um, he was really banging the drum for that that can this year about like, you know, what is the business case for creativity and like going everyone involved, be you client, be you agency, be you uh, an art director or a business director and, and any of our, our partners. It's like, it's not okay. It's not enough just to say, we think it works and we've got a suspicion it works and we can look at awards and feel good it works. It's like, you, you, we, we're all going to get challenged as the world hits a, we're not allowed to use what recession are we, even if you have two quarters of negative growth, which used to be the simplest definition. As, as the world reshapes itself in a kind of post COVID easing, post quantitative um, uh, monetary policy way, and like people scrutinize things, which is really happening, you know, across the board right now, it's easy to get, it's easy to get nervous and easy to go, ah, let's just do something simpler. Let's be risk averse right now. Risk is scary for businesses. And of course, creativity thrives in risk. Be you deciding new businesses or thinking about new ways to, to talk to, to your customers about whatever it is you do. We're all going to need to have a, a sense of the business case for creativity. And I think the, the, um, Protecting, protecting the spark, capturing the lightning in the bottle is going to be the macro thing that aligns all of us, whether we be client, agency, partner, supplier, you name it, to, to keep doing the magical stuff we do that we know works and prove it works. So there's a long rambling <laughs> intro. We started talking about creativity, <laughs> yeah. but this is how it is. Such, yeah, Let me go such, we are. Such, such a rich background and the name dropping of brands that, as you say, maybe even you know, 10, 15 years ago, wouldn't have been part of the picture. And yet now are just, it's our everyday taking it for granted. And the consistent word as you're telling your story is creativity. Creativity is such, such an important. It's easy to come out with these statements, you know, the power of creativity in business and being so important, but what, what do you think is sort of the essence of creativity and, and how's it going to change in the future? So, so I think the, what, what I'm most excited about in our industry right now is that if I compare to, to the late nineties, when I started out, it creativity was much more bounded. So our world was simpler, fewer things to do. You had, you had businesses, you had people who were buying from them, whatever the shape it was. And the number of touch points and channels between was fairly finite. You, you, there were only so many things you could do. And we jammed all the money down, all of those, and everybody did well out of it. And you had, you had these little moments of like uh, discussions around logo sizes and exact moments of, of, of uh, copy on body copy and print ads because it made, really made a difference, right? It was those, those fine margins around things that everyone was doing that were the difference between the beer brand that everyone cared about 
and the beer brand that wasn't top of mind when people were walking up to a to a bar at a pub. Um, I learned a load in that game. I learned a load playing that game. It's just not the discussion right now. Now, like the the number of things you can do and should do are so so much wider. Just within just within the narrow P promotion of, of marketing, never mind product and place. Um, still the same number of companies. In fact, more companies because it's easier than ever to start up a, a, a brand or a business. And we as a culture appreciate newness more than we did when I started. Established brands are cool, but what's cooler than a brand is a startup. And as you say, Louise, you know, if you if you look at any of the the um the kind of brand power rankings done by Brand Z or Future Brand do some from us or Wolf Olin's shuffle the order but number one two three four and five is basically apple amazon microsoft google there might be there might be one of the old legacy brands sneaking up there a coke or a mcdonald's or someone but it's basically tech companies because the measure of the value of a brand is can i launch a new business and who's been most successful at launching new businesses under umbrella brands well guess what it's it's tech companies that do that so we've proven we've proven that we can we can create real business value off, off tech brands um I must be trying to thought, but yeah, I was saying like, you know, the, the, the amount of things you can do now and the amount of competition coming in means that we just don't have the, it's not smart business to obsess about the same micro details in the same way. So the best creative people are getting pulled naturally, beautifully. And they've always wanted to do this away from copywriting purely still a craft, still very important, but it's up to business design. And I think for me, the, the pivot moment, the kind of little aha moment I saw in my career on this was there was a there was a kind of year, and I can't actually even remember when it was. I remember the discussion, the sentiment more than the time, but students of advertising, as I'm sure some of you are, will, will know when this was. There was a wave when we we as an industry moved from celebrating neat executional creativity out to what I call like program creativity. And the one that, that absolutely nailed it for me was a piece of work celebrated by Crispin Porter when they were the hottest agency in the world, but very much shared with a, a client of my group, American Express, around Small Business Saturday. And instead of people, instead of the industry going, oh, that's so, that's so clever that you put, and again, I'll make some stuff up to, not, to avoid embarrassing you. It's so clever that you put a raccoon playing the tambourine on, for this ad. It was like, <laughs> oh, wow. The problem is that American Express charges three and a half percent as, a, as an acquisition fee, don't want to get into fintech. American Express is really expensive for the shops. Um, so they bring you great people because Amex customers, Amex cardholders are rich and spend money. So as a small store, I'm like, yeah, I want to take Amex, but Amex really charge for the for the for the pleasure of that compared to never mind Visa, Mastercard, but like Square and and you know all the all the merchant payments processes. So you've got Amex there going, we've got what all shops want, rich shoppers. But we're having this difficulty in embedding Amex acceptance into, into stores because people are going, I, I want it, but you want three and a half percent of the money, which is crazy for doing none of the work. And they, they, you know, they solved that challenge by bringing creative people in from Crispin Porter. And I'm no, I'm no shame in bigging up other agencies for doing great work. And then instead of applying their creativity to go, is there an advertising solution? They created this the words change, but generally programmatic, not in terms of programmatic advertising, but a program solution of like, mm -hmm. we have to embrace small businesses as a, as a group of customers and understanding the culture, how we as Amex can support them to make up for the fact which charging three and a half percent. And so it becomes small business Saturday. And then watching the case study of that rip around the industry was maybe I'm slow and everyone was there a year before me, but I was like, oh, there it is. Creativity has changed. It's moved from being executional into being business design and programmatic and that was probably the moment that started my journey out from from being in an ad agency um because i was looking for to places where i could go and and like use creativity not as a creative so i was never an art director I was never a copywriter but um understand and i'll answer your question directly about what creativity is as part of this understand how i can bring that way of thinking to bear to do business design and then in all honesty if you go back to 2013, the easiest place to do that was mobile because none of us knew what we we're doing. Everything was new. So there weren't big established companies. Even the big like web software houses that were living in a desktop world weren't really set up to do brilliantly in mobile. So a bunch of crazy kids like us could go in and end up building 
the world's most used sports app for FIFA or build banking apps, the Royal Bank of Scotland or Santander in Spain and build payment systems for Visa when we had no real authority or right to do that. But um, hey, we've been doing mobile as long as anyone else, so why not? Um, and I think, you know, that th there's a ton of great, it's a good, it's a good Google question, what is creativity? Um, so in advance of this, I did a bit of it and I kind of made some notes and then tried to put my own spin on it. I think um, it's attributed to Einstein, which probably means he definitely didn't say it, but the quote <laughs> about intelligence having fun is a, is a good start because it isn't just smart thinking that, which is, you know, there are good ideas that aren't creative. I think we can all intrinsically feel that, but the, um, that second part of like the emotional response is captured by just a part of like having fun. Um, cause it isn't having fun or funny. There's a, there's an intelligence and an emotional response. If you get sort of scientific about it, that I think defines creativity. Um, it's really hard because I don't think there's anything more slippery in the world than emotional response. Um, you, you know, when you get it in your personal lives and your professional lives, but the conditions by which you get it change from moment to moment, from person to person, from place to place, from time to time. That truth is what sits at the kind of like, ah, oh, you'll never be able to control or tame or, or productize creativity. Sure, I agree actually about that second part. Again, we'll, we'll pick up on that today. But there is something about, there is some, there's something about the diagonal thinking inherent in moving from here to here, not in a straight line, but not just being random, that creates something new that adds an emotional response, I think defines creativity. And, and, and you can feel it when you've done it. You know when you've just kind of iterated something. Iteration is important. Optimization is important. I don't quite call it creativity because then you're in the, you're in the kind of literal path. And I think there's that like, what about this that comes from, a, from, a, from an insight and a spark and then is put through at the moment, just people, but at one day there'll be machines that can do this because we're gonna copy the brain. Um, that diagonal jump that I think that's smart, smart purveyors, buyers and sellers of creativity understand that that diagonal thinking angle. Jonathan Milton, Paul, the old Coke head of advertising, used to talk about it a lot. Um, I think that's kind of the heart of what it is. There's this a sense of, of, a, of a creation of something that changes an emotional response. And if you've done that, then it's creative. Mm -hmm. um, it's a difference between a tag graffiti and a nice mural. It's the difference between uh, shapes on a page and art. And it's the difference between communication that is functional and communication that is creative. And I love that when you were telling that story of creativity that we segued into the work with it with mobiles. Yeah. And so many people, when you talk to them about creativity, they're thinking along sort of the traditional lines, still, as yeah. you say, hugely important, copywriting, the, the artistic side. But of course, uh, automation has impacted incredibly and, and, yes. and accelerated creativity. And it's still creativity. Would yeah, you talk exactly. a little bit sort of on, on that, how it has accelerated and, mm. and brought it in a new this, direction? Yeah, this is a, this is a fun one. So... Um, so the, the doom and gloom pessimist naysayer version is like, oh God, that's it. We're going to be replaced by, by AI and robots who are going to be never take a sick day and they never crash their car on the way to work and they don't get, you know, they don't get depressed or, or, or elated and do silly things. They stay on, stay on task. Um, hmm. I, I wonder, I think that while I'm much more optimistic in general, uh, and I've been working with tech companies, so I know kind of where we are with some parts of AI, although maybe I'll get surprised. I think that, I think that there, there, there is a sci-fi Terminator point where we create the AI that can recreate itself and we lose control of what we're asking it to do. I don't know, let's not go to the Philip Dick, K. Dick land. I think the, the, um, the, great, the great challenge to creativity is time. If we all have infinite resources, infinite amount of time and money, then wow, we will we'll be creative go away spend a month walk in the woods drink a glass of wine do some yoga on a hill come back and bring me a thought like 
it's tougher to do than if you've got 15 minutes, right? You, you've got more time to iterate through stuff. Will automation free high value human thinking up from having to do menial stuff to give us more time to do the creative stuff? Absolutely. I 100% believe that. I see, um, I see, uh, I'll say that when we talk about data later on. I think that, um, I think that we, that time is the key to it because we, we want to be able to like synthesize inputs and synthesize data points that give us real insight for us to be creative on top of. And if you've ever spent any time sifting through data while being able to automate those tasks is a nice thing. And how you kind of get signal from noise is something that a computer is better at doing than a person. And you, and you see this as we see the beginnings of the like fusion of automated processes with creativity. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that all around the world now, people are going into these interactive Van Gogh exhibitions. Um, there's, a, there's a Rembrandt one, I think, of as well, where yeah. we're trying to train computers to recreate new works of art by going, here's all the brush strokes by a creative person, extrapolate. Now, people are pretty smart. So we appreciate that for what it is. No one's like, oh, well, there's a new Rembrandt or a new Van Gogh. It's like, no, it's something that can only be done with the power of, of machine learning but it needs AI people talk about trading. It needs the seeds of, of human creativity. Um, and that's where we are right now. I see lots of the kind of like, let's automate previous human creativity to make interesting things. We have a company in our, um, in our family here at IPG. Uh, you used to be called, if, you, if you're a can, a can Lions watcher, you'll have heard of FCB6 over the years. Um, sort of go through a bit of a rebrand and it's called Performance Art now, which is, a neat title because it's as creative as you can come in terms of the output, what they do and very much an art, but designed to live in a trackable, measurable, like prove it works, performance type world. And it is super interesting stuff where they, they absolutely come in and go, we want to automate the things that need to be done to allow us to operate at scale and allow the creativity to be applied as the right lever at the right time to create amazing and wonderful new things. Um, some of the famous stuff they did was around um, for a company called Black and Abroad in the US, which was um, leveraging the idiocy you see on, you know, the, the kind of sadder parts of social media around, uh, in particular, the phrase, go back to Africa, towards African, um, African, African American, Afro Caribbean people in the US, to actually leverage that kind of hate term as a way to sell holidays. To Africa for people who've been who've been targeted, so they kind of reclaim to go back to Africa as like, hey, no, actually, it's a great, it's a great, um, it's a great rallying cry for people to understand heritage, and you sort of can't do it without a sense of the big data approach. It's not a case of like go on Twitter and find one person who's being a, you know, to be polite but being a prick, and then find the people impacted by that, and then use their negative. You can't sort of do it individually. You've got to do it at scale, and they're all about scaled and automated solutions where we can take a human creative intuitive idea and then make it come to life all, all around the world and they're doing very interesting stuff with companies that that basically have data but have never found creative ways to use it yet and whereas that that the list of companies that would fall under that bucket used to be pretty small now because you know people are getting a hang of the value of like of customer data and we've got a nice window where regulators are still fairly okay for there to be a nice transaction between customers and businesses around around data you know everybody's got everybody's got more insight than they ever used to have as to real people what they really care about what they really do when um and what an opportunity to be able to find ways to apply apply human creativity because it's still a while before before machines could, we found pack the way that the synapses and the neurons work to be able to recreate a machine that can be generally creative. Apply human creativity to vast amounts of inputs and insights gathered by machines to build brand new things we can't do. Um, and you feel it, right? You feel it coming from the companies that are have the human face of technology. I'll put Amazon in there because I'm biased, but Airbnb are really good at this too. Spotify are amazing at this, you know. 
you get tired of stuff quickly, but like every year still at the end of the year when it gives you your personalized Spotify listening list and what that means. But, you know, you can feel it coming. You feel that synthesis of like emotion of music with reality, business reality of an automated platform that can recommend things to you and how that can be not just functional because it's great as a business tool to make people sign up to Spotify and keep listening to music, but also how it can be creative. And to go back to my phrase earlier, how that days can be used to change your feeling about the emotional response of the Spotify brand for them to fight against Apple Music and Amazon Music and Deezer or whoever else is going in that space. So I think, um, I think you know, as with all these things, you whether, you're, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're probably right. So if you think you can't survive automation, then, well, you're probably right. But if you think you can thrive in an automated world, again, you're probably right. And I think that the kind of optimistic approach to go free, free people up from stuff to allow them to focus on what they want to do. That's just a good thing. You know, it's been the promise of, of tech since robot butlers and the Jetsons back in the day. <laughs> but if I think about, if I think about what we're doing inside all our agencies right now, that's absolutely our task, right? So we're trying to create, we're trying to create little bots and little bits of like repeatable, scalable tech that can get our genie people out from being data entry folks or, um, you know, context providers or analysts and get them up to being strategic and creative because that's where that's where people want to be. That's where, in all honesty, to compete in the talent war that's out there these days, which is always brutal. You know, we people want to do meaningful work and we can help more people do more meaningful work if we could automate the drudgery and get them out of just being like processy. Apart from those golden, golden people who love love doing process. We love them. I oh, can't get enough of them. <laughs> I mean, big data is sort of the buzzword. Is that there's so yeah. much data out there? Obviously, a company called company like Amazon, so much data to draw on, and it often seems to be an either or conversation. Big data yes. does it? Is it or creativity on the other side? And you know, yeah. never the twain shall meet. But you don't agree with that, do you? You don't think it's versus? I I, I do not. I do not. I think that very rarely in life do we ever come across anything where it's this versus this. I think um, uh, if I could be, be slightly, slightly philosophical about it, um, black versus white versus shades of gray, the Taoist symbol of the, uh, the yin yang is a closer approximation. It's opposing forces that work together. I always think that decision-making is a balance both answers are right. So what are you going to do now? And I think that's kind of how it is with data and creativity. I can't imagine a time where you don't want someone to be thinking about what does this mean and how does it matter? How can I, how can I use this opportunity or this problem or this no or whatever, whatever the thing we need to solve is to not just fix the problem, but make the thing better as well. And that's a creative process to me. Equally, I think the days of like, uh, I don't want, it's, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a uh, creativity is this muse and it's uncapturable and it's unmeasurable and it can never be replicated it's like sure you can try that but i don't think many people are going to fund your hobby unless you are as wildly creative as you know a sculptor or a painter where you kind of get to break free from the economic realities of the world and you have a patron someone goes i love the crazy stuff that comes out of your brain so much that i will literally just give you money for you to create things with no commercial imperative just they exist for the sake of themselves lovely thank god thank god there are people in the world who are able to create art and music and sculpture and even nfts although i think that's perhaps less artistic than those guys think but yeah all all that stuff out there that people want to have for the sake of it luxury clothes and shoes and handbags and beautiful cars and whatever amazing brilliant 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 when when you're in the land of commercial creative creativity like like i am and like you know most of us are who do this stuff there's a reality about the funding that comes from all of this. You're sort of borrowing shareholders' money at the end of the day where the, the, the ability to continue to get that money to fuel your creativity and build new things is going to have to be backed with some sense of, of data. I, I'd point anyone who cares about the, because about the, again, I don't want to read someone else's text out, but one of the CEOs of, of, um, of one of our companies inside IPG um, who's one of the kind of proper genius guys in our, in our industry as well, 
um, the CEO of Huge, which is a really interesting um, digital transformation company, for want of a better word. Uh, they kind of yeah work on how a business can reorient itself for a digital future around comms and platforms and everything. A um, guy called Matt Baxter, he wrote a article in Inc., you know, the INC, the, the um, magazine website, about creative capital. Um, and that's a, that's a term that we use a lot when we talk with our with our clients and we think about um, uh, how you need to have creativity that makes a difference, but also measure and optimize it to move forwards. And we think about capital and business all the time, right? There's human capital, there's working capital, there's, I don't know, intellectual capital. They've got value on balance sheets. And like, if you start to think about creativity in a business as, um, as creative capital that you can have to actually make a difference and apply, and not just something that kind of gets rebooted every time, but something that builds and becomes a living part of your enterprise, that it completely changes the way that you approach it, treat it, nurture it, protect it, grow it, develop it, innovate around it, and make it part of your, part of your business. So I definitely point anyone who cares about kind of rethinking what creativity is as an essential part of the business rather than something that's unmeasurable towards that. For me, I guess the the um, the way I put it is that like, I see it like a ladder. And um, I think I may have talked about this on a podcast with, with uh, Jake from 42 Courses one time, but so I drew this on my wall years ago and I've sort of seen a version of it flying around around the industry in, in the years since. At the bottom of the ladder is data, which I think was your original word. And there's, you know, there's a lot of data out there. Data point could be seven or it could be left or it could be every day. Like there's just stuff happening all the time. I'm being measured on this, I'm being measured on this, being measured on this laptop. Everybody's tracking everything. Data's fairly useless in its purest form because actually if I, took, if I was to dump a CSV file on someone and go, here you go, here's all the data, you can't really do anything with it. There's, there's the level one which makes data into information. Information, I'd say, is a subset of data. You've got all this data out there, but you only really need to know a thousand of these 10 million numbers that I can give you because they're the ones that actually matter to what you're trying to do. And then how do you make data into information? I think the answer is context. Once you have context, you can look at the data and understand um, uh, which of it is information. That part, but to back to our last discussion, that's getting automated. You should be able to write rules that work out enough with enough accuracy which of the data is information. Then it gets interesting though, because once I've got the information, I want to kind of take the next step up the ladder and go, okay, I know which numbers are important, but like, how do I, how do I use them? How do I turn that information into the knowledge, which means the next run of the ladder? And that's analysis. And that's where it's blurred. I think that's people and that's machines. And that's where the creative thinkers are starting to come in. So if you're in data science, um, you can be wildly creative. And some of the folks who work inside performance art, inside huge, inside RGA, inside initiative, inside our great agencies who are able to go, the numbers say this, but the story is this. Those analysts, very creative people, can see the future and can extrapolate from numbers. And then, then the real art is when you move from knowledge to wisdom and you start taking things into action. And that's where the creative and strategic people live. So um, I think that it isn't a case of like, I don't want that. I don't want that data. Don't give me those real human insights. Don't give me the real world sense of what's actually happening because I want to be creative. Not really. The creativity of the future is like, oh, I need to know exactly what's going on in real world from real people because I only want, I only want stuff that works. If you go right back up to like creativity and say, what is it? And extrapolate on that Einstein definition, I could ask three questions of what of something to be creative i could say do i care if i don't care then it's probably not creative does it make me think differently if it doesn't make me think differently is it creative and last one does it work and if your project or your task or your thing your stuff whatever it is makes people care makes people think different makes people think differently and it works then i think that's the modern creativity and you can't do that without data because i just don't think there's much scope for for you know does it get people excited and think differently if we don't know it works and if you don't know if you have the data you don't know it works you've got to have some sense of how this thing survives contact with the real world because 
um, that's really where where businesses that, that will keep us all you know motivated and, and rich and fed and happy it's where they're around their heads so it's never it's it's as always it's rarely an either or it's more like a how do i synthesize reality that comes out of data get it up the ladder and turn it into like wisdom and then use it to to, to create an emotional response for people it's great to hear your insights and i'm sure there's plenty of people on this call are scribbling furiously with everything that oh. you're saying there yeah. and we've had some great questions i love to stay ask you so much to ask you but i do want yeah, to yeah. bring in the people who've uh, been so kind as to join us on this call and we've had a very interesting uh, question here from ron godfrey thank you so much for putting that question to us uh, ron and i'm going to uh spotlight you here and bring you into the conversation so that you can ask your question to uh tom directly yeah. if you'd like to unmute yourself Thank you, Louise. Uh, hi, Tom. Thanks. Very interesting stuff. Uh, hey, I come from uh, I come from a business where uh, creativity is the last thing that we do because uh, for many many years I've been in financial services and uh, to do with stopping people from doing the things that they shouldn't do. Um, okay. Both from the um, firm's point of view, but also from the uh, customer point of view, trying to get behaviours that are good for outcomes for um, people. And the, the reason for my question, just to give you the background, is that every time something new comes in in financial services, we always say the law of unintended consequences will apply. And I've been saying that for de decades. <laughs> the latest big one of this is um, the Chancellor uh, in the UK got up uh, seven years ago and said something stupid about nobody needs to buy an annuity in the future. And they thought that they'd sorted out all the possible things that could go wrong from doing that. But they didn't. They missed huge things and be people behaved completely differently. And all the creat creativity that happened after that was uh, people being um, missold in the biggest and widest sense, things which weren't necessarily the right thing for them for the wrong yeah. reasons. And people um, were using, uh, I've now discovered, they were using lots of behavioral science techniques to do that. Um, and the reason to give you the background is to get to where my question is, which is <laughs> when you're being creative, where have you seen things which have turned out completely counterintuitively um, so that you set out to do one thing and you produced something completely different? If I could be a bit crude about it, where did you find your Viagra moment where you went out to find a heart, a heart yeah, I... uh, uh, drug and found something completely brilliant? Thank um, you, yeah. Ron. Great question. Yeah, Thank you. Like, Tom, good, Tom, how are you going to address that? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, man, FS, many years. Okay. Um, well, look, I mean, I think it's very interesting about the Viagra thing. I mean, of all the, of all the, of all the pharmaceutical side effect stories, that's the nice one because, wow, there's some nasty ones. And if you watch TV shows about the US pharmaceutical industry in particular, you'll just be very depressed in life. Um, I, like, hey, regulated categories, medical, financial services, always add a layer of complexity. Uh, and I would, and again, it's been a few years since I did anything in UK financial services. So I'll, I have full sympathy. I'd stray away from trying to make any recommendations. It's, um, it's an interesting one. What I said before, emotional response and people in the real time, really hard to, very impossible to control, quite hard to predict. Um, so think about, you know, think about what you're putting it out into the world and what might happen as a result of it. I would, I would always in a regulated category where you, you can't, you're, you're accountable and responsible for things you do as part of an ecosystem. Be careful about how your decision-making process upweights while creativity versus versus risk and governance. And like we built we built mobile software for car companies and we spent I spent ages trying to get into the head units of the cars. I'm like, let me into the car because there's so much data in the car that I can and they were like, best one in the world, love you guys, Alpha Romeo mobile apps fantastic. 
if the car crashes and people die, we get sued for million. You, this is a different world you're in in sometimes. So um, I could answer it with like ads that went wrong uh, and everyone's got funny war stories about that. But I don't think that'd be that interesting for you. What would be the time we tried to build something and we create something different? I, not for my world, but one of the guys I work with started another company. They sold to Klarna, you know, the suite. I'm sure you know them very well. The, well, the largest private company in Europe right now. There's a, they're a really good example of like a kind of like repeated pivot company. And I know there's some potentially some challenges coming for the, the unregulated credit that sits inside their model. But they didn't start as this like break into four unsecured credit type product. They started thinking about ways to, to change the payments industry and it accidentally built the thing that became the heart of where their, their company is now. I think you're in, when you're in, and FinTech loves this. I don't know exactly what, what company you're in, how they work, but I'm sure you've got someone who's a kind of pure proposition-led FinTech person in your space who's got all these ideas about why the legacy way is wrong and the, this is over-regulated and that. And in fact, it's all about a customer experience. Um, You need to have, you need to embrace that flexibility so that you don't over design yourself into a fixed solution that can't move with some kind of change or pressure. So I think what, I think we don't, when we were building stuff, ever accidentally create something that wasn't what we set out to do, but we definitely set out to build things that aren't like locked in to only be one thing for the next five years because life moves pretty quick in tech and finance and customer habits change and competition comes and goes so it's a bit of a fudgy answer but um what be the best what would be the best one a lot of the stuff we did with royal bank of scotland group was kind of around that so i don't know if you've ever worked with rbs but you've got decades of legacy infrastructure in the way that they you know have all this stuff held together with basically the, the digital equivalent of sticky tape and, <laughs> and gaffer tape and string but you've got customers going, hey, I'm being seduced by Starling and Monzo and I want a new way to look at my money. And I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in why you can't show me a balance that's live um, purchases because you've got to run through some strange old automated teller machine, you know, um, cash point rails. So, you know, we, we tried to help those guys be flexible about going, hey, push here or give up a bit on this because you've got to make that balance between what's easy and comfortable to do and where customers are going. And some of our like mobile ma money manager, peer-to-peer -peer payment type stuff was pretty uh, on, the, on the cutting edge of that. Uh, and I'm sure that our, a good example would be, we built the, um, the Royal Bank of Scotland and Coots business banking app for, for small businesses. And that was, if I think about the original feature set that we went in on our discovery project to go, what are the key things we need based on, you know, interview a lot of small businesses, interview the bank, try to find that middle ground of like what's beautiful and what can be done. Um, what we ended up building 18 months later coming out of an agile process was very different to what we went in on, but it wasn't a case of like, oh my God, we accidentally built something. It was more, hey, don't bake yourself in to not be able to make the move if you need to based on the realities. And I think the, one of the very interesting things and where, where it's hard for like, old world creative people to appear in technology is the an understanding of time frame because uh an ad is a discrete unit that can go out can be going from comp from like brief to you know final product in three months whatever pick a number but then continually evolving a roadmap of a technology product with creative people in in software engineering and ux and visual id and ia and all the people that go into that you know it takes 18 months sometimes to be up and running and your M well that's if I'm your MVP, which is a word I don't like, um, or, or not a word I don't like, but a, a product that I don't like to build, your MVP to your final thing could be very different. I'll, I'll give you a I'll give you a little nugget coming out of Amazon because this is one that's public. Amazon don't deal in MVPs. So if you try and build a, a minimum viable product inside Amazon, you get fairly short thrift. They actually see the the kind of bar to launch as a minimum lovable product. Um, and if you, a lot of people in the fintech space have a, I don't remember who came up, there's a little like overlapping circles model of like 
viability, usability, feasibility? Like, is it possible? Does it like, does it make me money? Will people use it? And can it be done with the tech? You need all three to be in line. But what's your what's your driving lever? Often the viable is like, you know, spend as little as you can to get something that will do the job. Um, Amazon don't do that. Take take that take that what you will. Think about how they launch and build companies and services. They're like, sure, I can do it. But if it isn't minimum lovable product, will the customer get excited? That's the uh, that's the bar for entry. Um, I like MLPs more than MVPs. And then also let the feature set flex as you go, because you need to have, you need to have enough of a, a sense of um, what's right to change versus what you've got to actually keep in any, any, any piece of, of software, especially in something as complicated as FinTech or medical. I'm just starting to work with some of the pharma and medical guys inside Amazon now. And again, it's another, whole world around my head around i've never done pharmaceutical before but it's like again you the data is different the regulation is different consequences for getting things wrong are different you're dealing with health not just shopping behaviors so very different emotional context around that for people that you have to design around thanks thanks so much tom thank you ron ron's giving you the big uh, thumbs up there yeah <laughs> and um, we've got another question that's come in from our members who've joined us. Uh, Yulia, um, I did see Yulia up here. I'd just like to pop her in the spotlight. There she is. Hello, Yulia. I'll just give you the spotlight and maybe you'd like to put your rather different question to Tom about sort of the, the practicalities of agency and client life. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your time. Very interesting uh, speech. Um, actually, I work in the beer industry in brand management, and one okay. of the problems I face is we don't feel really, we can't really build long term relations with uh, local agencies uh, because yeah. uh, when we teach many agencies, it's easy to find one great idea. But how can you really foster like better creativity in the long term relationship with the agency to make sure that you really have this breakthrough, even if you don't have like plenty of agencies coming with different perspectives? Thank wow, you, Yulia. Okay. That's a big question, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> uh, his agent, agency guy trying to answer a client question about how to do great work. So. Um, and I do know a bit about beer. I, I worked for. Um, for Carlsberg Group for quite a long time uh, as an agency side. So, so I know that this is more, more, more current for me. I would say that the, there's, there's two different approaches to this. Uh, some clients go, got to keep agencies sharp and hungry and they're always pitching everything and very competitive. So you basically, you recreate what you said there, which is you do a pitch, you get everybody at their best, working so hard, they are over and above and you get tons of great ideas. But there's an energy to that, that you as a client feel from your agencies. Some clients want to keep that going forever and just basically keep everybody in like pitch mode by bringing new people in and threatening and not working with the same partners a lot. I'm not going to sit here and say it didn't work for Coke in the 80s and 90s. Uh, uh, I know an automotive company that sort of works that way where lots of people are playing jump ball, the American phrase. And if you Google how many different creative agencies work on Amazon, there are people at Amazon who do that as well. And you get some great work out sometimes if i was taking the other approach i think the 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 biggest obstacle there are probably two obstacles to like a long-term agency uh not staying hungry and creative and sparky with you one would be if they're scared of being put to pitch because fear reduces fear a lack of trust or fear makes people not take risks and i you know i've seen from the inside around the companies i've worked at there's these relationships that start off exciting and then both people stop like challenging each other and then it's okay and no one's getting upset and then two years later there's a review and always the client goes just lost the sense of like innovation because 
I don't know, it, people are like either were scared to do it or you or you got comfortable. And the, the always pitch mode can fight the, is the agency comfortable? Pre- I prefer dialogue. I think if it's a, I think you build things together over time and knowledge is useful. Like incumbent knowledge can be very useful. And I always encourage clients to think about ways that you can keep use building with an agency you have. The, the trust part's really important though. So your agency has to feel that they are, encourage and incentivize in the right way to bring some things that maybe don't work exactly and they're not going to be held to it because if you try and take all the risk out of the client business which i can be very tempting and i've run a business and hire people so i know it's nice sometimes people to go wow it wasn't me the agency um that environment will never get you what you need either and i think you know i'll, I'll take a counterpoint from amazon while they have a lot of agencies working on them. If I take their most high profile piece of of advertising work for the year, it's the Super Bowl ads. Every year there's, you know, the Super Bowl, the American most watched show in the world, blah, 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 blah. And it's almost become the advertising Super Bowl as well, where everybody analyzes and dissects what ads run in that moment. There are only about two or three of the agencies that Amazon use that they would ever use to do that Super Bowl ad. And those guys know that they're going to get some of that work because when it really matters and you need to do something that's of high value to your brand, I would always say you want someone you know and trust who's going to do the right job for you. And there's a real risk of being in that consistent pitch mode that you get shiny stuff, but these might not be people you know and trust. And when you really need them, they haven't been able to commit to it. So I would say I like relationships. I think it's on it's on the agency and the client to say, hey, we never want this to get boring. We've got to keep it so that we're both challenged to challenge each other. But an environment of like an environment of trust and a bit of like, it's okay. It's okay to bring us stuff that we would both decide isn't right without that being a problem for you. Because if you get if fear hits the relationship, the quality of like of innovation thinking goes down. And there's a reason you have an agency, you don't do it yourself, is you want outside perspective um and you've got to have that outside perspective be something that's welcomed by the business and I know that could be that can be tough because client organizations don't always align and and there's all the internal challenges of that we have we have clients where we, we work with in-house creative teams a lot with agency teams as well um and you always find that if it's antagonistic, it doesn't work. It's got to be. It's got to be enough understanding of commercially why it's worthwhile for both parties, and then, and then align people around real challenges and problems, and give people things to do that are real. And then, you that normally tends to work, even when it's kind of oh, we'll execute this and you do that, but we think that. Uh, the other thing I'd say is pay for the right things you care about. So if you care about ideas, find a way to pay for ideas, not just final executions because then what you do is you force people to get to bring you things that might happen to get paid um commissions in media you know uh things like that or or, or heavy incentives that are based around making things that work like agencies have always been really um traditionally most of us have been bad at selling strategic and upstream thinking we get really mugged off by consultancies on that we're very good at selling that stuff not saying we want to be consultancies but like um yeah really be think think about what you really want and find a fair way to pay to incentivize the agency to give you more of that good stuff because we're very simple people we respond to incentives <laughs> like everybody else thanks so um, much tom great and, question and good, Sorry, and good luck with it good luck with it amazing category <laughs> rise of non-alcoholic destruction of the on-trade environment with covid i have full sympathy thank you but, julia but Super great product question. people love Thank you so much. And it's been amazing to hear your insights and your great responses to the questions, Tom. And everyone who's, everyone who's joined us, thank you so much for taking the time to sign in. You can hear Tom, uh, his other insights in conversation in our 42 Courses podcast, if you want to have a look in that direction. And there's also excerpts in amongst the Creative Effectiveness course. But for now, on behalf of 42 Courses, I'd like to really thank you, Tom, for joining us for this fantastic hour of insight into the workings of your mind and your expertise in uh, so many areas. And to thank everybody, of course, 
who signed in to join us and hope that you will join us again for another event. Thank you very much my, and goodbye. My pleasure. Good luck, everybody. Keep learning. Curiosity is a, is a, a powerful, powerful force. That is Colin Powell, the recently, recently deceased former US government official. He, he wrote an amazing list of 12 rules, rules for life, um, which is a really great way to like, think about stuff. He had one in there which said, relentless ambition is a force multiplier. I think that's a great message to leave with and like learning's part of ambition. So it's good. It's great what you guys are doing. Love 42 courses. I think you, you guys have an amazing platform to help people follow their, their passions and their interests. Um, nothing more ambitious than that. So thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. And, um, That's a, a great closing message. A great closing message, go. Tom. Thank love you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye.